manufacturer, and they've been an integral partner with USI and its engineering program since the beginning. Uh, we hired a lot of our graduates, provide a lot of uh, internships, and a lot of uh, really nice student projects. This is one of those students' projects from a lecture. Students are Zach Mishler and Zeke Seven.
uh, requirements. We coordinated with all veteran personnel necessary to complete this, uh, design and estimate the low side of the substation, perform a circuit analysis on the surrounding area to uh, give suggestions for new circuit layout, and as telecom billing, must have a dedicated circuit because they are a key customer. So to dig in a little bit more on what the power grid is, uh, the, this is a functional block diagram of the power grid. Starting out at the power generation is the power plant itself. Uh, it's usually coal and natural gas fired, um, a turbine at the power plant. Outside of the, outside of the power plant is a substation uh, where it transforms the voltage off of the turbine into 69,000, 138,000, or 345,000 volts uh, in the vector system. Those are the standard voltages. From there, it is sent through transmission lines across the uh, vector in the area. At a certain point, it, uh, when the load is necessary, we put in a substation. It's a distribution substation where we transform from transmission voltage down to distribution voltage. The distribution voltage that we're dealing with is 12,470 volts. From the distribution voltage, we send out distribution lines, which are your most common lines that you see uh, feeding down the road. This is the distribution voltage line that leads to the customer's uh, house or wherever it is, where we put a pole mounted or pad mounted transformer uh, that transforms the voltage down into a lower usable voltage, which is usually at house voltage is 120-240, or a common commercial voltage is 240-480 volt. From there, uh, we run a service line to the customer's meter point, and at that meter point, Vector provides a meter to them, and that's how we know what their usage is and how we actually charge them. This is the scope of our project. It uh, falls in between the distribution trans or the transmission to distribution substation into the actual distribution lines, uh, which we call the circuit exit. Uh, a few ways to protect people to make sure they have reliable power. Uh, it's by grid protection, and some of the causes of our outages are from weather, which cannot be controlled. You know, wind can cause the lines to move or gallop and run into each other, causing a short. Uh, ice getting on the lines from freezing weather and also getting stuck by lightning. Um, wildlife can control also. Uh, squirrels or birds or anything, a snake getting on the line, you know, getting in a transformer or something. Um, Equipment failure, uh, a vehicle accidentally running into the pole, and some of the causes are actually unknown and must be figured out. And breaking news, customers do not like being without power. So Vectron's protection system, uh, here's another functional block diagram of our uh, protection scheme. Uh, this is on a usual circuit, what we try, the perfect layout would be from the distribution substation, uh, there is a circuit breaker, which a picture can be located down here. Um, as you can see up here, each one can feed into a fuse itself, um, which Zeke is holding. Um, the fuse is a single shot. Um, basically, if it senses that there's a fault, it will burn the fuse, and there, there's a chemical reaction that causes an explosion and will actually cause the arm to fall. So when you're standing out as a lineman, um, you can look up, and if you see this, then you know that the fuse is blown, uh, and that's how we know that we have an outage in the area. The fuse itself is this little wire, um, and this is rated for different uh, amperages, and that is decided by the engineer on what size uh, fuse we need at each point based on the load downstream. Uh, this wire will melt, and like I said, it's a chemical reaction that causes the explosion. Some of the other protection that we have is the hydraulic recloser, hydraulic or electronic recloser, which is here, and the sectionalizer, which is here. Um, these are very beneficial. Uh, in the recloser, they provide a one fast curve, three slow curve uh, fire. Basically, they act the same way as a fuse, except they offer multiple um, explosions, basically. Um, what a recloser does is when it senses a fault, it locks out and kills the electric downstream of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, from there, it waits a certain amount of time and then it closes back in. So it re-energizes the line that's downstream. When 
that's re-energized, it senses again. If the fault is not cleared, then it'll lock out and it will do that three more times. The reasoning for this is if a branch or some wildlife is on the line, it will actually burn it off. Um, so then the customers stay in power for as long as possible. The reason for the one fast curve is to possibly save the fuse. Um, it operates, if we can save the fuse, then nobody has to go out and fill the fuse back up and everybody stays in power. Um, usually whenever there's a storm, your power blinks. That's a good thing for the most part. Um, that means that our protection scheme is working. So I know it's inconvenient because your clock's reset, but it's actually good. That means that the system is working properly. Uh, customer needs, uh, new facilities must be met by all vector codes, vector standards, and the NESC. Uh, all new facilities must be installed in areas where veterans have sufficient rights. So we must own the property in order to build there. That includes getting easements or buy-in. And uh, must meet all veteran standards. This is another close-up of the substation, just to give you an idea. Uh, from here we made our general layout, this is the existing, 69 comes in here, this is the transformer, it goes into the regulators in the bus and it gets, or the breakers in the bus and it gets regulated and goes out. So what we're going to do is attach new bus to here and we're only dealing with the third exit for now, but we designed it and designed it for the fourth and the transformer will be here, it'll be connected and it'll be, this is the circuit breaker, this is the bus and it'll be regulated and attached to the distribution exit. Uh, this is the one line of the drawing you just saw. Uh, if you look in closely, you can see all the monitoring and all the detail. Uh, this is the voltage, or vacuum circuit breaker. These are the voltage regulators, and this is a, a relay system. Uh, each part you can see has disconnects, so if something were to go wrong, you could go in there uh, do maintenance on it, and it would also be able to be connected. So if a problem happened here, it would be able to, this breaker would still be connected through this. So we would still be able to operate normally. This is the, the third circuit layout uh, from the distribution side. This drawing shows the different paths of each of the new circuits uh, represented by each new color. Uh, those are called out over here. Azteca milling circuit, which will be the dedicated circuit feeding directly into Azteca, is the pink circuit that feeds up and down through here. Uh, this will be what we will call the new circuit, even though this will be on the new uh, set of regulators and fed from the new transformer. This will need the new name for the circuit. Uh, it will feed in the same path uh, with new poles uh, represented by these open circles. Uh, this is a fence around the outside and gates, so that's the substation fence. Uh, the green, which is Highway 41 circuit, is an underground fed circuit, uh, which comes from uh, the uh, voltage regulators and drops directly underground and feeds to the bottom of the substation. We had that option for our new circuit. Um, the reason that we didn't choose that, the terminators, which is the point where you, trend, you change from the overhead cable to the underground cable, are uh, known to go bad much quicker than the overhead circuits and it's much harder to work on, especially in a substation because you have the grounding grid. Um, so it's much better, we prefer to go overhead and that's why this route was chosen. I have notes on the drawing. Um, for note one, two, and three, they are uh, gang operated switches, which is a large rack that operates all three phases and the neutral at the same time. Um, basically, there's circuit disconnect switches. If there's maintenance that's needed, the crew can go out and open up one of these switches and kill everything that's upstream or down, excuse me, downstream of that fuse. So that uh, should something need to be taken out, they can work on whatever needs to be at a de-energized state, which is much much safer and it's cheaper um, because they don't have to blanket everything. Um, at note four, five, and six, these are circuit ties. What circuit ties allow us to do is if there is an outage or if we need to open a disconnect switch, we can actually feed from a different uh, direction. So if this was open, then this line would not be fed anymore. So we could use this disconnect switch or this uh, circuit tie switch and close that in and this would all continue to be fed. 
Uh, it's not a uh, permanent fix, but it does help with switching and keeping people on power um, as much as possible. So then this is, uh, with Zeke's drawing overlaid, uh, this is the internals of a substation. You can see the A, B, and C phase coming out uh, from each of these and hitting the new poles and feeding in the direction. So it gives you a little bit better idea of what is actually in the substation itself. Uh, in order to choose the pole size and figure out exactly what we need, uh, this is a measuring stick that has a hook at the end that uh, is rated for 100,000 volts per foot. Uh, you can grab onto the conductor, the live conductor, and it gives you a measurement of how high you need to be. Uh, this particular measurement was 36 feet. So at that 36 feet, I know that I need a pole that can at least reach that height. Uh, so what I chose was a 45 foot pole. What that does, uh, when you have a 45 foot pole, you bury uh, into the ground 10% plus two feet. Um, so with that, you end up with a 38 and a half foot pole um, that is above ground that can actually connect. So I use a 45 foot pole in that location and that's how I know which size pole that I need. These are the transmission lines with the distribution on the bottom. This is 69,000 volt up top and this is 12,000 volt in these areas and these are the poles that are located right outside the substation. This is the construction drawing uh, that would go to the uh, actual construction crews. They take this and they would go from point to point um, starting at point one and working their way through the entire drawing. Uh, like I said, these are the new poles. Um, so there will be three new pole locations. Notice on here that there are, I call out the cable sizes, 636 all aluminum conductor with a 355 aluminum conductor, steel reinforced conductor uh, neutral. I also call out the GOAB switches uh, located in the area. Um, and then the guide wires are uh, specified that 32M is the size of the guide wire, and then the lead length, which is the from the bottom of the pole to the where the actual guide wire is laid into the ground, um, and that's to reinforce the tension that's uh, applied because of the uh, overhead lines. The reason I don't have any guide wires here, uh, these are slack span, which means that the only tension on that cable is from the weight of the cable itself. We use a pole loading program to test that. Um, and from that pole loading program, that's where these numbers come from. Uh, it's an Excel program that Vectric purchased, uh, which is very beneficial when looking at areas like this. Uh, a little bit of our budget. Uh, we were budgeted 1.2 million for the substation additions and 200,000 for the circuit exit additions. Uh, for our estimation and design, we included that the substation additions would be 550,000, and that only includes the third exit um, and the foundations for it. So the transformer and the fourth exits, including the three extra regulators and the extra circuit breaker, are not included in this. So. We're left with six hundred fifty thousand dollars to complete the rest of it. And from my end on the distribution side, we used a uh, budget of fifty-seven thousand five hundred. Um, this can be seen a little bit better. The way that this is called out is we have a program called Maximo uh, that I go in and we call for the each CU, which is the cost unit, uh, at each station, which I pointed out on the construction drawing. Uh, the station is given here, so at point seven, these are the materials that will be used at that point. Um, at each point, there are like the conductor uh, dead ends, which is where the cable connects to the pole. Um, from there, you call for the number of uh, each unit that you need, and it gives you the time and hours required for each component that is called for. At, at the top, you can see the 57,476. That's the actual estimate for the distribution side. The uh, remaining budget will be used for the fourth circuit exit, which is gonna be much bigger. There will be more poles, um, and it will take a little bit more uh, money to complete that, which we did complete the plan um, for the fourth circuit exit as well. We didn't include that in here, um, but we wanted to let the next person to work on this project have some idea of what we had in mind when we designed it. Uh, in conclusion, Vectrum's overall goal is to provide safety and reliable power to all its customers. With this in mind, all work completed by the design group follows all standard practices, 
pledge forth by the veteran and the NESC. And the acknowledgments we'd like to give out. Uh, first, we'd like to thank Veteran uh, for allowing us to do this project um, and for hiring both of us on as interns. Uh, special thanks to Larry Rogers and to Andrew Denhauer for acting as our uh, advisors for each of these projects. Uh, they've helped us out on numerous occasions and uh, let us work with either themselves or um, personnel in their group that uh, have been instrumental to this project. Uh, we would like to thank Dr. Cuban for being our advisor and meeting with us every week and helping us out with uh, the project side of it and making sure we hit all of our dates. And uh, last, the engineering faculty um, for coming to our um, dry run presentations and for putting up with us over these last couple of years. Um, so we want to thank you very much. Questions? All right, questions. <clears throat> Uh, one question is, uh, have you done a project like this before? And if so, what similarities have you drawn uh, while doing this one? Uh, I actually, I have done a um, project much like this, a uh, substation addition where we added two more circuits onto a substation in Mount Vernon itself. Uh, the difference, that was a little bit more open. This took a little bit more design aspect of trying to fit things in. Uh, there we had more easement to work with. We had more area to go um, in vectoring property. This was kind of fitting it into very small spaces. Um, but it is very similar in that the cable sizes and the things that we use for the actual substation design of it um, are similar. It's just a different configuration. Other questions? How much downtime do you anticipate for, for STEC for this switch over? Hopefully they won't see any outages. Uh, because they are fed from the transformer uh, that's existing, they should be able to complete the construction with everything dead and then have a simultaneous switch um, and they should not see any any power uh, outages whatsoever. Any other questions? All right, let's give them a hand.